Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about the solved case of Sasha Marsden. She was a young teenage girl who was horrifically murdered coming up to a decade ago now. It wasn't long after Sasha's body was found when an arrest was made in connection to her case. The police very quickly identified the person that they believed had done this to her and when they started investigating him and the events leading up to Sasha's death they realised just how premeditated and planned this crime was. Sasha's story is a really, really heartbreaking one. What this young girl went through, not just in her final moments, but also in the years before her death, is just absolutely awful. But in the aftermath of this case, there was something so positive to come from it. Sasha's sister Gemma was able to create something so positive and so, so important. She set up a campaign called Yes Matters and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on in the video. Before we get into the case, please listen carefully to the following content warnings. This video is about the murder of a teenage girl and it involves heavy themes such as sexual assault, rape, violence towards women, bullying, depression and self-harm. Viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case, we are going back to the year 2013 in the seaside town of Blackpool, which is located in Lancashire in England. And this is Sasha Marsden. She was a 16 year old girl who lived near Blackpool. She lived with her family in a village called Staining in Lancashire, which is about three miles, just over three miles away from Blackpool. And the Marsden family had lived there in Staining since around 2004 time. They moved to the area when Sasha was about eight years old. Sasha Marsden was born on the 7th of May 1996. Her parents were called Gary and Jane Marsden, and Sasha was one of five children, the youngest of five children. She had two sisters and two brothers and their names were Gemma, Mark, Katie and Thomas and Sasha was the baby of the family. And her family said that because she was the youngest that meant that Sasha often got away with the most. She was described as being very cheeky and a bit mischievous. She would love to wind up her siblings. She was fun. She had a lot of friends who she loved hanging out with. Sasha was at that age where, you know, she found it a little bit embarrassing being seen with her parents but equally she relied on her parents a lot to take her places. She would often ask her dad Gary to drop her off at her friends, drop her off here and there. Sasha was described as being quite stubborn at times, like I said she could be quite cheeky, she wasn't afraid to push boundaries and her sister Katie said that once you met Sasha you wouldn't forget her. She made such a long lasting first impression on people and she was also just very loving and kind and caring. She was one of those people that was always there for others. Sasha's friends described her as being such a supportive person. If someone was feeling down, she would always try to cheer them up by making them laugh. She loved music and dancing. Her friends actually said that as soon as Sasha heard a song that she liked, she didn't care where she was, she would just start dancing along to it. Even if she was out in public, if she heard a good song, she would start to dance, which I just think is so lovely. As I said, Sasha loved loved hanging out with friends and I think a lot of her friends lived in Blackpool so they would often hang out there. Her parents would drive her from their home in Staining to Blackpool so that she could see her friends. Sasha Marsden just seemed to be a very happy-go-lucky young girl. She was very much a typical teenager but then when Sasha was around 14 years old in the summer of 2010 she became the victim of a truly horrifying attack which seemed to just changed the friendly and bubbly teen and had such a devastating impact on her mental health. One day in July of 2010, after Sasha had finished school for the day, she and a friend of hers had decided to go into Blackpool together to hang out for a few hours. They went to a park in Blackpool and from what I can gather, the two of them were having a really nice time until they were approached by a stranger, an older man who was about 22 years old. This 
this man started chatting to Sasha and her friend and eventually he offered her some vodka and Sasha, I don't think she had ever tried vodka or alcohol in general before, she was only 14 and so she decided to have some, she was probably curious as to what it tasted like and of course this meant that she didn't have a very high tolerance level for alcohol so after she drank it she pretty much passed out on the ground, this man had given her enough that she just passed out and as soon as she did pass out he began to assault her he started raping 14 year old Sasha in the middle of this park this children's park and the friend that was with her just didn't know what to do I believe he was a little bit younger than Sasha so he was so so scared he knew that he wouldn't be able to overpower her attacker because the attacker was a fully grown adult man but thankfully as the attack was happening two women two members of the public spotted what the man was doing to Sasha and they immediately called the police and they literally grabbed the man off of Sasha as she was still laying on the ground. The police contacted Sasha's parents who at the time were expecting her to arrive home within like the next half an hour or so. Her curfew was 9pm every night and they were contacted by the police at around 8.30pm. Her parents were called and the man was arrested for rape and he was charged and convicted and he was sentenced to spend five years and four months in prison. And as you can imagine, Sasha was was never really the same after this. She was left with so much trauma after the rape. Her mental health just went completely downhill. She held so much anger after what that man did to her, understandably. And what made matters so much worse was that at the same time as this, she was also just having an awful time at school. She was being bullied so badly by some of the other kids. They made fun of Sasha, they called her horrible names, and one of her peers even said to her, that she deserved what happened to her. She deserved to have been raped. Her parents did ultimately take her out of that school and she started at a different one, but despite that, Sasha never really wanted to go. Her attendance began to decline and she would just skip school a lot. Her parents said that Sasha just started to rebel a little bit. She started drinking alcohol. She was getting drunk a lot, probably in an attempt to momentarily forget or stop thinking about the horrific ordeal that she had endured. She started seeing many different boys, she struggled massively with depression and she also started self-harming too. And as well as skipping school, Sasha also began running away from home a lot. It happened so many times. She would just leave home and not come back, I think for days at a time. And of course her family, her parents, Gary and Jane, were so, so worried every single time it happened. They would constantly be out looking for her. They would drive around in the car trying to see if they could spot her. They got the police involved on many occasions. They would ask for their help in trying to find their daughter and thankfully each time it happened Sasha would be found safe and she would be brought back home. I don't think she was normally that far away but there was one occasion where it was a totally different story. I believe it was around the end of August, early September of 2012 when Sasha ran away from home once again, this time with her boyfriend. She had been seeing this boy named Danny who was a couple of years older than her. One night Sasha went out with Danny and she just didn't come back home. She was supposed to ring her parents to come and pick her up but she never did and they kept trying to ring her phone but she wasn't answering so eventually they reported her as missing to the police. About two days after Sasha ran away she finally got in touch with her parents. She rang them, told them that she was okay and that she was currently staying in a town called Lowstoft in East Suffolk which is very far from Blackpool. It's just under 300 miles away so she and Danny had gotten very far. It's believed that Sasha just felt the need to get away for a bit. She wanted to get away from the place where she was raped but obviously her family just wanted her home. Gary and Jane just desperately wanted their little girl to come back to them and so they came to an agreement with Sasha that if she came back they would let her boyfriend Danny move in with them. So her dad went to pick them both up and Sasha was home again and it seemed that after this things started to change for Sasha for the better. Over time things started looking up. She gradually started to feel better. Her mental health started to improve. In the autumn of 2012 she became a student at 
a local college. She started studying childcare because she wanted a career working with children when she was older. And she really enjoyed college and she was doing so well on her course. In fact, after just a couple of months, her teacher decided that Sasha should move up to the next level of her course because she was that good at it. And as well as going to college, Sasha had also decided that she would really like to get a little part-time job somewhere so that she could earn her own money and just have that bit more independence. And it wasn't long before she secured a job interview. In early 2013, she applied for a job as a cleaner at a hotel in Blackpool. And she was successful and she was asked to come to the hotel for a kind of trial shift to see how she did. I believe Sasha went for her trial shift on the 28th of January 2013, which was a Monday. Her dad, Gary, drove her into town, into Blackpool. He dropped her off on the high street because she had arranged to meet with the manager of the hotel on the high street and then he would walk with her to the hotel to show her where it was. And yes, yeah, Sasha went for her trial and after about 90 minutes, her dad came and picked her up. And when she got home, she told her family that the trial shift went really well. She did a little bit of cleaning, she made up some of the beds, she'd had a chat with the manager and she was really happy because even though it was a trial shift and she wasn't really doing that much work, she still earned £10. The manager gave her £10 when she finished and he offered her the job. So Sasha was over the moon. She was so excited that she was going to be earning money now. This was her first proper job, I think. And her parents were so happy for her and they were so proud of her as well to see how far she had come since the horrific assault she'd completely turned her life around just a couple of days after her trial shift on thursday the 31st of january 2013 sasha woke up that morning she got ready for the day and then she headed to college it was actually that day at college when she was informed by her teacher that she would be moving up a level on her childcare course so it started out as being a really good positive day for sasha after after college finished that afternoon, her dad Gary drove to collect her and then from there he dropped her off near the high street in Blackpool because she had her first proper shift at the hotel that day. So Sasha got out of the car, she said goodbye to her dad and she said that she would ring or text him later on when her shift had ended so that he knew to come and pick her up. And off she went. She started walking to the hotel and Gary went back home. After a good few hours, Sasha's parents, Gary and Jane, really realized that they still hadn't heard from their daughter. She hadn't messaged them or anything letting them know when she needed picking up. And so they tried messaging her. They texted her and her dad tried ringing her, but there was no answer and her phone seemed to be going straight to voicemail suggesting that perhaps it was switched off and they didn't really think much of it at first they just thought well she's probably just preoccupied it's her first proper shift at her new job so she's likely just busy and she hasn't really had a chance to look at her phone so they carried on waiting and they thought well she's bound to get in touch by 8pm because Sasha and her boyfriend Danny had actually made plans to go out that night at around 8.30 plans that she was excited for. So they kept waiting and waiting and waiting but when 8pm did roll around strangely there was still nothing no sign of Sasha or any contact from her and she still wasn't answering her phone and I think it was at this point when panic did kind of start to set in. Her family just couldn't understand why they hadn't heard from her yet. She had been gone for hours and hours surely her shift would have finished by now and so they decided that they needed to try and find her. They needed to go to the hotel to see if she was still there. Only problem was they didn't know exactly which hotel she worked at. Obviously there are so so many in Blackpool because it's a seaside town. They get so many tourists visiting and staying every single year and obviously her dad Gary had dropped her off on the high street because Sasha had said that the manager would come and meet her and walk her to the hotel so Gary didn't know where it was and so in an attempt to find out, her family took to Facebook. You see, Sasha's boyfriend Danny knew that the manager of the hotel was a guy named David and that Sasha had been conversing with David about the job via Facebook Messenger. So Sasha's parents and her boyfriend logged into her Facebook account and from her messages, they could see that the manager's full name was David Minto and luckily he had the hotel's phone number and address on his Facebook page. So they dialed the number 
number and they rang the hotel where Sasha worked but they had no luck no one answered the phone however they had the address so they decided to drive to the hotel once they got there they knocked on the front door and a man answered it was the manager David Minto when he opened the door Sasha's mother Jane said that she was looking for her daughter and she asked if Sasha was still there however David said no she wasn't he actually said that her shift ended quite a while ago a few hours ago and she left he said that she mentioned going to meet her dad outside the Madame Tussauds Museum in Blackpool so this only made Sasha's parents worry even more why hadn't she rung them when she finished work and where was she now I mean they knew what Sasha could be like you know she did have a little bit of a history of running away from home but back then she would run away because of everything that she was going through after the rape she would run away because her mental health was so bad so it's not like she had never done this before but this time it just seems so different because Sasha they thought was in a much better place now she was happy with her boyfriend Danny she was enjoying college she just got on her first job everything seemed to be going well for her so what reason would she have now for wanting to take off it just didn't seem to add up and so her family carried on searching for her they were driving around the area looking for her they were going to her friends houses to see if maybe she was with any of them they even rang the local hospitals to ask if they had any record of a Sasha Marsden being admitted there because they thought that maybe she had gotten into some kind of accident or something and she'd been injured but there was nothing no sign of her anywhere they continued messaging and ringing Sasha's mobile phone but still they got no response and eventually when it got to around 11 p.m that night her parents decided that they needed the police's help in finding her and so they rang 999 and reported 16 year old Sasha as missing. Shortly after the report was made a couple of police officers arrived at the Marsden's house and they began just collecting as much information about Sasha as they possibly could. So they were asking questions about the clothes that she had on that day, they were asking questions about you know her appearance, her build, her height etc and as they were doing all of this Sasha's parents noticed that one of the officers kept excusing himself he kept leaving the room to answer his phone I think he did it a few times and then he would come back into the living room and sit back down and then after a short while he got up and he excused himself once again he went out to take a phone call and when he returned he unfortunately had some heartbreaking news to share with the Marsdens he revealed that the reason he kept having to step out of the room was because he had just been told by colleagues that a dead body had been discovered it was the dead body of a young woman and because Sasha had recently been reported as missing they believed that it was probably her. Just a couple of hours before this, before the Marsdens contacted the police at around 9pm on the 31st of January, neighbours who lived close to an alleyway in Blackpool noticed a lot of smoke. There was a fire in this alleyway. So these neighbours all came out of their houses and they went to the alleyway to try and find out what was actually on fire. And at first it looked as though it might have been a mannequin or something. So one of the neighbours got this big bucket of water they poured it over the fire and the flames died down however it was then when they saw blood this mannequin seemed to be covered in blood only of course it wasn't a mannequin after all it was the dead body of a young woman she had been set on fire in this dark Blackpool alleyway so one of the neighbors called the police and as I said it was a few hours later when 16 year old Sasha Marsden was reported as missing when they had their first lead on who the victim might have been they strongly believed that this body was Sasha however the body was pretty badly burnt so they couldn't tell just by looking at her it wasn't until a few days later when DNA tests confirmed that yes the body in this alleyway was in fact Sasha's and a post-mortem revealed that the 16 year old had been brutally murdered. In Sasha's post-mortem it was determined that she had died after sustaining numerous stab wounds. She had been stabbed repeatedly both in her neck and the back of her head. In fact it was concluded that she had sustained around 56 stab wounds in total. This was an incredibly 
vicious attack. But Sasha did try to fight back. She tried so hard to fight for her life and in the process she sustained a lot of self-defense injuries on her arms and her hands. But unfortunately a 16 year old girl was just no match for someone with a knife. And it was clear that this crime was sexually motivated because Sasha had been sexually assaulted by her attacker. She had been completely violated and it's not actually known whether or not she was assaulted before or after her death. I don't think the pathologist could be 100% sure on that. A truly horrific murder. You cannot imagine the terror that Sasha must have felt during that attack. So as soon as her body was found, the police immediately set out to find the person that did this to Sasha. Find the individual that killed her and set her body on fire in that alleyway. And of course it wasn't long at all before they had their first suspect. It was David Minto, the man that had given Sasha the job at the hotel. Sasha's body was actually found in the alleyway right behind the hotel, so the police were incredibly suspicious of him. So 22-year-old David Minto was arrested straight away and he was taken to the police station, taken into custody. And whilst detectives began questioning him, other officers began just looking a bit more into him and what they discovered was very interesting. They found out that David Minto didn't actually have any authority at all to hire someone. He did work at the hotel but he was like a handyman there, a caretaker. He wasn't the manager. It was David Minto's girlfriend and her mum who owned the hotel and they I think ran it together. They were the managers, not him. He had absolutely nothing to do with hiring people. It was not his place to do that. He hadn't been given permission to do that so why did he offer Sasha a cleaning job there. The police also discovered that on both the days that Sasha came to the hotel, so the afternoons of Monday the 28th of January and the day that she died, Thursday the 31st of January, David Minto would have been the only other person in the hotel with her. His girlfriend's mum wasn't there and his girlfriend wasn't there either. I believe she was always out on Monday and Thursday afternoons for another job that she had and she didn't get back on the Thursday until around nine that night and after speaking to her the police learned that when she returned to the hotel at 9 p.m that thursday night she actually noticed a very strong smell of cleaning products they were coming from her boyfriend david who was cleaning and before she even said a word about it he said quote before you say anything I've been cleaning up because I had a nosebleed. His girlfriend also informed the police that she didn't even know that her partner David had hired Sasha to work at the hotel and I imagine she must have been pretty confused by this because like I said he hadn't been given authorization by her to do that. In fact the hotel weren't even looking for any cleaners at at that time because it was January, it was the winter and so the hotel was closed because people would mainly travel to Blackpool in the summer months. So David had hired Sasha to clean the rooms and make up beds when no one was even going to be staying in the rooms for months. So all of this really made alarm bells ring for the police. It seemed as though if David Minto was the one who killed Sasha, this crime was premeditated. It seemed as though David Minto had hired Sasha, he'd offered her a job which was fake, literally just so that he could lure her to the hotel. And he purposefully told her to come to the hotel during the times that he knew he would be there alone. So the police asked him during his interview at the police station if he did it, but he said no, he didn't kill Sasha. But he claimed that he and Sasha had had, quote, sexual contact while she was at the hotel that Thursday afternoon slash evening. He said that when Sasha got there, she basically threw herself at David. She wanted to get with him. And so, like I said, he said that they did have sexual contact. He wouldn't actually say that they had sex, he would just say sexual contact. And he said that afterwards, Sasha's nose actually started to bleed. So he began helping her to clean up this nosebleed and then after this, she left. She walked out. He claimed that the last time he saw Sasha, she was alive. So this is a very interesting account. David Minto initially claimed to his girlfriend 
that he was the one who had the nosebleed and now he was saying to the police that it was Sasha. It appeared as though he was just saying that because if the police say found blood in the hotel and this blood was a match to Sasha, he had covered his back. He could say, see, I told you she had a nosebleed. So he was basically saying that someone else must have killed Sasha after she left the hotel and then someone else dumped her body in the alleyway behind the hotel because it was not him. Of course, the police did not not believe that David Minto's story and following his arrest a forensic team was sent in to search the hotel for evidence and they found a whole lot. They discovered a lot of blood inside the hotel, much more blood than a nosebleed would cause. Sources state that blood was found throughout the hotel so I think it was in several areas although I think it was mainly in one of the corridors downstairs. Minto had tried to clean some of it up but clearly he had hadn't done a very good job and when samples of this blood were taken and sent off for testing it was concluded that the blood in the hotel was a match to Sasha Marsden. The police also discovered in the hotel kitchen what they believed to be the murder weapon. They discovered a knife which had Sasha's blood on it. In addition to that, they retrieved some clothing from the hotel, some of David's clothing, which again had traces of blood on it, blood that matched Sasha. And apparently there was also a little bit of Sasha's blood on the clothing that he had on when he was arrested. So he had clearly gotten changed after the murder. But even the new clothes that he put on, he managed to get some of Sasha's blood on. And as well as the blood evidence, the police also just found other items relating to Sasha. In one of the bathrooms they found the back of one of Sasha's earrings that she was wearing that day. That was actually discovered in the toilet so I don't know whether he had maybe tried to flush it to get rid of evidence. But also in the bathroom they found Sasha's necklace which again she had been wearing that day. So there was a lot of evidence against David Minto and yet despite that he still stuck to his story. He said that he was not the killer. But regardless, the police had enough to charge him with the crime and so that's exactly what they did. Just days after Sasha's death, on the 3rd of February 2013, 22-year-old David Minto was charged with the murder of 16-year-old Sasha Marsden. And when it came to his plea hearing, the denial continued and David Minto pleaded not guilty, which resulted in the case against him going to trial. Minto's trial began in in mid July of 2013, about six months after Sasha's murder, and he was cross examined during the trial, and he seemed to add to his version of events he added to the previous story that he gave to the police. During the trial David Minto said that Sasha came to the hotel that day. He reiterated that once she got there she threw herself at him. They had quote sexual contact which he claimed was consensual and then he said that afterwards she started to make her way out of the hotel and he walked back upstairs to carry on with some jobs that he needed to do. He started doing doing some cleaning. However, he said that shortly after this, whilst he was cleaning, he heard a noise. I think it was like a bang or something. And so he went downstairs to see what this noise was. And that was when he found Sasha lying on the floor. She was covered in blood and she was dead. And he said that in that moment, he just panicked. He was confused. He didn't know what to do. But instead of calling for help, instead of calling the police or an ambulance, he picked up her body, he carried her to the bathroom, and he decided to wash her. After washing her body, he said that he wrapped her up in a bin liner and also some carpet underlay, and then he carried her to the alleyway behind the hotel, and he just left her there. And he claimed that he wasn't the one who set her on fire. Someone else must have done that. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. This story does not add up at all. You're telling me that he just found Sasha's body on the floor in the hotel. She was covered in blood. She had clearly been brutally attacked 
and he just didn't call the emergency services. Instead, he washed her and left her outside. What innocent person does that? Also, was he not terrified when he found Sasha? Did he not get scared that the person who attacked her was still inside the hotel somewhere with a knife? Did he not fear for his own life and think that he should probably call the police? His actions after he supposedly just found Sasha's body just don't make sense at all. It's completely absurd. And so the prosecution gave their account, their theorised version of events based on the evidence that had been obtained. The prosecution believed that David Minto lured Sasha to the hotel that day with the intention of sexually assaulting her. Maybe originally he didn't necessarily plan to kill her, but he intended to sexually assault her. And it turns out actually that Sasha's trial shift, which took place just three days before her actual murder, wasn't the first time that she'd met David Minto, it transpires that David Minto was actually friends with a friend of Sasha's named Kim and she just happened to meet David I think just briefly about four months before this case took place in September of 2012. Sources state that initially David Minto tried it on with Kim, he even indecently assaulted her and when she showed no interest and basically told him to leave her alone, he decided to turn his attention to Sasha. He sent her a friend request on Facebook and just as a side note, his name on Facebook was actually David the Demon Minto and just four days before Sasha's murder and I think the day before her trial shift in late January of 2013, David Minto sent Sasha a message. Now initially, Sasha didn't actually remember David. She didn't recognise him so I think she declined his friend request but then he messaged her saying something like, oh, I met you that one time with your friend Kim, etc, etc. And so it was then when I believe Sasha added him back, she accepted his friend request. They got talking and quickly Minto offered Sasha a cleaning job at the hotel. He pretended that he was able to do that, that he was the manager, I guess. And Sasha said, yes, as we know, she was so, so excited about this. She was just 16. This was her first proper job and she was so happy that she was going to be able to earn her own money. So Sasha accepted this job having obviously no idea that it was actually fake and David told her to come to the hotel on the afternoon of the 28th of January and the 31st of January, times when he knew he would be alone there. And he actually told Sasha in the messages that she should come alone too. Apparently he said something like, oh other people make me nervous so make sure you come on your own and she probably thought nothing of it. At around 3.50pm on the 31st of January, he met Sasha on the high street just like he had done a few days earlier and they walked together to the hotel and the police did actually obtain CCTV footage of this. David is the one in front, he's wearing a white jumper with his hood up and Sasha is following behind him. The pair arrived at the hotel shortly after this and it's been estimated that Sasha was attacked and killed some time between four o'clock and five o'clock that afternoon. It's believed that he made sexual advances towards Sasha. He wanted her to sleep with him but she resisted. That wasn't why she was there. She came because she wanted to work so she turned him down and that probably angered him and he decided that he was going to force her into it. He didn't care if she wanted to or not. He was going to use the knife to threaten her. As we know from her self-defence injuries, Sasha tried to fight him off. She tried so hard to try and prevent him from raping her. This had already happened to her once before and she obviously didn't want to go through this again. So she was fighting and fighting and fighting but unfortunately he was able to overpower Sasha and he started stabbing her repeatedly with a knife both in her head and neck. From what I can gather, Sasha was murdered in a corridor downstairs in the hotel as that's where forensics found most of the blood. And when the murder weapon was found, the kitchen knife, the police noticed that the tip of the knife was actually bent slightly, where he had been stabbing Sasha with so much force. As we know, at some point she was sexually assaulted, either 
while she lay dying or after she was already dead. And then afterwards, Minto wrapped up her body in a bin liner and carpet. He took her outside to the back alley and he set her on fire. And what the police also discovered was that whilst her body was on fire, David Minto was actually among the rest of the neighbours who had come out of their houses when they noticed smoke. He was standing with all of them, trying to act like this concerned neighbour. Apparently he was even like calling other people over to look at the fire and when his girlfriend got home he told her to come outside to see it. He wanted to show people what he had done and it turns out that his girlfriend was the neighbour who actually called the police alerting them to this body that was on fire. In a further attempt to cover his tracks the prosecution told the jury that Minto also changed his clothes and he tried to clean up some of the blood evidence using cleaning chemicals. And during the trial, one of the witnesses that the prosecution brought forward was a young woman who had actually been attacked by Minto just weeks before Sasha was murdered. This woman was 22 years old and she did actually know Minto and his girlfriend prior to what happened to her. And he too offered her a cleaning job at the hotel just like Sasha. So she arranged with Minto when she could come round for her first shift I suppose. He told her to come on a Thursday just three weeks before what happened to Sasha. Again it was a day when David knew that he would be alone at the hotel and once she got there Minto began showing her around each of the rooms until eventually they got to his bedroom. The woman said during the trial that at one point both she and David were sitting on his bed and she said that she just felt so so uncomfortable. There was just something about his presence and this situation that didn't feel right to her. She felt very, very on edge. And it soon became clear to her that David hadn't brought her round to give her a job. He brought her round because he wanted to have sex with her. He quickly started trying it on with her. He kept trying to kiss her and she was telling him no. She was pushing him away. But despite that, he did not stop. He kept trying to touch her. And so she quickly got up. She ran out of the room and out of the hotel and she got away. She escaped David Minto with her life. Sadly, Sasha would not be so lucky. And after the attack on this woman failed, it's believed that Minto decided that he was going to try again. And Sasha was his next target. But with Sasha's attack, he made sure that this time there was no way that his victim would be able to get away because he was going to be armed with a weapon, a knife. David Minto's trial came to an end on the 26th of July 2013. After hearing from both the defence and the prosecution, the jury went off to deliberate and it only took them a matter of hours to come to a decision. Their verdict was guilty. 23-year-old David Minto was guilty of the murder of 16-year-old Sasha Marsden and he was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 35 years meaning that he will not be allowed to apply for parole until 2048. Just the year following this, in 2014, David Minto did actually try to appeal against his sentence. He was hoping that it would be lowered. However, of course, this appeal was rejected. He still has to serve at least 35 years before he is even considered for release. Following Sasha's death, one of her older sisters, Gemma, decided to set up an organisation, a community group, called Yes Matters. Because after doing some research, she realised that what happened to Sasha wasn't uncommon at at all. So many young girls and just women in general are victims of sexual assault and abuse and violence at the hands of men and so Gemma wanted to set up Yes Matters not only to educate and raise awareness of this but also to provide support for other victims, girls and young women who have experienced abuse and have been assaulted, girls like Sasha. As it states on their website, Yes Matters mission is to prevent abuse, challenge and improve current practices and support victims in their rehabilitation. Yes Matters provides resources to schools all over the UK to educate children and teenagers on consent, gender stereotypes, sexual objectification culture and so many more important topics that should be talked
talked about in schools. They offer workshops, they hold events on both International Women's Day and International Men's Day. Gemma attends protests to campaign for change, she does a lot of public speaking for her campaign and as I said most importantly Yes Matters also provides support to young people, survivors of sexual violence and abuse and their victim rehabilitation services are completely free. A really incredible organisation. The work that Gemma has done since her sister's death is just amazing. So I will of course leave a link to the Yes Matters website in the description box below if you want to learn more about what they do and what they have achieved. You can donate to the organisation to help fund the work that they do. They also have a shop where they have a load of different awesome products that you can buy and the money from those sales will obviously go towards funding the organisation. I've actually just brought their more than pretty tote bag so I'm so excited for that to arrive. So I will also leave a link down below to where you can donate to Yes Matters and also their shop if you would like to buy something. But yeah that is it for this case. That is the case of Sasha Marsden. I'm finding it difficult to sum up my thoughts on this case. I feel like I have no other thoughts than just Sasha deserved so much better. It's so awful knowing the horrific ordeal that she went through when she was just 14 years old, when she was raped in the park by that older adult man. What she went through after that with her trauma and her mental health is horrific but the thing that just breaks my heart is the fact that she gradually did start to feel better. She found the strength to carry on and she was building a life for herself when just two years later another man decided to destroy it again. But this man decided not only to sexually violate her but also to end her life in one of the most brutal ways imaginable and the fact that he showed absolutely no remorse either. I actually read in one article that during the trial David Minter referred to Sasha as it. He didn't say she, he didn't say her name, he called her an it. A vile, vile, vile human being and I just hope to God that he is never ever released because he is such an incredibly dangerous individual. But yeah, that is the end of this video. As always, please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on this case in the comments. I would love to hear what you guys think. Also, feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. A few of you have actually let me know recently that my case request form hasn't been working, so I do apologise for that. I am going to look into it. But for the time being, feel free to just leave your case requests in the comments and I will We'll see them. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye!